Thank you for tuning in to the K Onda Show with your host, Dee Dee Blaze, here on this great radio station. The K Onda Show is a variety show specializing in the entertainment world in music, movies, television, sports, and other specialties. For the next hour, Dee Dee will bring you some interesting interviews to entertain and educate. So if you're listening to this program at home or at the office, your smartphone, or your car, let's begin with Dee Dee Blaze on the K Onda Show. This is Dee Dee Garcia Blaze with the K Onda the show, a radio show program that shines a spotlight on Chicanos and Latinos and anybody who's willing to work with our community. And today is a very special day because I have Cecilia Garcia Akers on the show right now, who is the daughter of my number one <laughs> Mexican American Chicano hero of all time, Mr. Dr. Hector P. Garcia. Cecilia is the daughter of Dr. Hector P. Garcia and Wanda F. Garcia. She was born in Corpus Christi, Texas. She graduated from Incarnate Word Academy and attended Del Mar College and Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. She is a graduate of St. Mary's University with a degree in biology and a graduate of the University of Texas Medical Branch Galveston with a degree in physical therapy. Her first job was medical assistant to her father, who was also a doctor, Dr. Hector P. Garcia, for 10 years prior to completing her physical therapy curriculum. She served on the Texas State Board of Physical Therapy Examiners for 12 years and five years as board chair, being appointed by Governors Mark White and Ann Richards. She was a member of the National Examination Committee for Physical Therapists for four years and has taught as adjunct faculty member member at the University of Texas Health Science Center. Welcome to the show, Cecilia. I also want to point out that you are the founding member of the Dr. Hector P. Garcia Memorial Foundation, and you're currently serving as board president and chairman. Yes, Dee Dee. Thank you so much for having me on your program. I'm so excited to be speaking to you. Tell us about yourself. I mean, your dad is an inspiration to me in what I do in politics. He did it right. He went straight for the jugular. And just <laughs> share with my audience what you love about your dad and you know what I mean? How he inspires Chicanos and Mexican Americans to continue to be politically active. Well, I, I think, you know, first of all, he had a personality about him that is, you know, someone like him comes around like every hundred years. I mean, you, you're never going to see another man like him. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he just knew how to get people to participate and to help him. He was always kind to everyone. He was highly educated. He was he was one that we could look up to, uh, but he was very strict, and you know, he never took no for an answer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and now I am writing a book about him and uh, kind of detailing his life and certain events in his life that impacted him to be who he became. So it's been it's been very good for me and, and educational and inspiring also. You know, you told me that. You know, he had, a per he had a strong personality. He just never took no for an answer. Can you share a moment that affected you as a, as a young girl watching him in his political activism? What was that moment that brings you to say that he didn't take no for an answer? Well, as an example, uh, when uh, George, George H.W. Bush became elected president, my father had a group of veterans called the Veterans Band in Corpus Christi. And he insisted that they would go and play at uh, President Bush's inauguration. So mm -hmm. when it didn't come through, <laughs> he got on the phone and, call, and called uh, the White House. <laughs> and he, he made the point that the veterans band was going to be at the inauguration. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just things like that. This was his whole life. But a, a very touching story came from a young man. Uh, that had been drafted to the Vietnam War, and he asked for a delay in going to service because his wife was pregnant with their first baby. Mm -hmm. So he was told, no, no, you have to report. So here he goes on his merry way. He, he reports to camp, wherever he, he was supposed to be, and his family went to my father and said, look, we just wanted an extension of our son to be here while his first baby is born. Do you know that that young man was coming back to Corpus Christi within one week? <laughs> oh, tell yep. us more moments. Tell us more. Well, you just know, this is, this is just, 
this is just the way he was. And, no, you know, he knew he knew how to manipulate the system. He knew how to get things that he, he needed. It wasn't just for him, though. This is what's so impressive. It was for all the people around him, all his patients. You know, when people had to get admitted to the hospital, he, they had no money. He would give them money to go there. You know, I mean, this this was his life. And so many people don't know what a kind person he was. Just, uh, you know, like I said, there'll never be another person like him. No, he was Chingon. He had Chingon factor. Right. <laughs> a very strong person. But I think early on he knew he had a mission, and this was his mission. And he knew from, you know, when he was in the military, he had to come back to Texas, and he had to uh, help veterans and uh, work in health care. And even though my mother's family wanted them to stay there in Naples to, for him to practice medicine after they got married there, he mm-hmm. said, no, I have to go back to Texas. And he could have lived a comfortable life in, in, in Italy, mm-hmm. never had to worry about anything. You know, he was already a medical doctor, uh, you know. But, no, he, he sacrificed tremendously to do the right thing. I was a member of a Wichita, Kansas chapter of the American GI Forum for a little while when I was living in Kansas. I was stationed by there. The United States Air Force sent me there, and that's how I got involved with that chapter. And and I noticed that, you know, the American GI Forum isn't as uh, strong in veteran issues of today as they were when your father uh, was at the helm of the operation. Tell me about your new foundation. You know, tell my audience about your foundation. Well, we started the foundation at the end of 2012, and it is it was established to make sure my father gets his rightful place in history, and, and I think he's not there. So this, this is what my husband and I were very worried about, and at the direction of my mother before she passed away. She was just devastated that no one knew who he was, all the sacrifices that they had made as a couple to improve this country. So we started the foundation. We've, we've given out $25,000 in scholarships so far. We wow. are working with... Texas A&M to build a Dr. Hector Wing at Bell Library so all his artifacts and his papers can be displayed and people can go research. You know, we, 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 we are getting a new facility named after him in Corpus. The first oh. primary care facility there in Corpus Christi will be named after my father, and that, that's through Christus Spahn. So I have another national award coming out this fall. Uh, named after him. I have my book that's coming out. So I, I, it was really a good move. It really was to separate us from the American GI Forum and do our own thing and really focus on him and his life and his accomplishments. Congratulations on the Thank clinic you. being named after him. And part of the reason for this show, Cecilia, is to continue on um, to, to catalog Mexican-American and Chicanos and Latino greats so we can pass on history to the future generation of Mexican-Americans. And that's why this show is special, because you are the daughter of Dr. Hector P. Garcia, who, who is no longer with us, and may he rest in peace. I kind of want to get political with you, just a okay. little bit of... Um, you know, we've got elections coming up in 2016, and um, it doesn't surprise me that the Republican Party, uh, one of their candidates by the name of Donald Trump, who is very anti-immigrant, and um, made a sarcastic remark on a national show to the tune of how immigrants are a slap in the face to veterans of today, and given the history and the work of your dad, do you have any comments? Well, the, when I hear when I hear this, I've been hearing this for anti-immigration discussions for a few years now. And you know what I you know what I tell those people? I point to a picture of my father, and I say there is an immigrant. He immigrated here when he was three years old. My mother is an immigrant who has a PhD in classical literature. I mean, you cannot just throw immigrants into a a classification like none of them are any good. You know, I mean, here they made their lives what they were, and they immigrated here. My grandfather brought his family here for a better life, and they worked the fields, they picked cotton, but they also had very high educational goals which six of his children became medical doctors, and two of them were females. So, 
It, it can be done. I, I think that Trump is now just placing fear into people, and, mm-hmm. you know, people think that immigrants are taking something away from them. But, you know, they want to assimilate into a better society, get an education, be able to vote, you know, have a good life, get get health care, get medical care, be taken care of like any other person would. And, and I, I just think that he's been successful by putting fear into other people. And, you know, I don't think he'll I don't think he'll go on much longer to speak or I don't think he can sustain it. I really don't. I hope not, not to mention the billions and billions of federal tax dollars that immigrants contribute to our national coffers as well as state and local coffers. If it wasn't for immigrants, you know, our nation would be bankrupt from a labor standpoint. And also, you know, a lot of the anti-immigrant sentiment is coming from the Tea Party. And to me, it's very asinine and hypocritical of these Tea Partiers where the foundation of the Tea Party, taxes. And if anybody is not represented, it's the undocumented taxpayer. Right. Tell us some more moments. Share moments about your dad. <laughs> I know. Well, one thing, you know, writing my book, I've been doing some research on his mm-hmm. life because he was he was not one to come discuss things. Uh, he didn't talk about his political wins over somebody. He didn't come in and and, you know, he, he just wasn't like that. But one of the things I think is very, very important about him, that he went to segregated schools. He went to UT Austin, graduated top 10% of the class. He went to UT Galveston. When he graduated, there were only three Mexicans in the entire country graduating wow. that year. He went to had to go to Omaha for his residency and, and um, surgical and medical residency. They would not accept him in Texas, so he graduated from St. Joseph's Hospital in 1942. He served in the military for four years. He gained the rank of major. Uh, they would not give him his captain rank. Uh, that I saw two denials for different reasons, but also there were two uh, letters to him saying, we lost your application, ha, ha. Yeah. He kept going and going. But the most interesting thing about that man that I did not even know, that he was not a U.S. citizen until November the 7th, 1946. So he fought in World War II. He took care of thousands of soldiers. You know, he fought through this, this system that tried to keep him down, and he made it. And he was not even a citizen. <laughs> November 7, 1946? Yes, that's when he gained his U.S. citizenship. I'm doing some work with uh, some deported veterans who honorably served our nation with honorable discharge, and the government doesn't do enough with uh, ensuring that they get their earned citizenship. Right. And, and that's another fight that we're trying to battle to make sure that if, you know, if the government, if our government is going to draft immigrants, and by the way, have you heard of that? I mean, I'm hearing that undocumented immigrants were drafted in American wars, Cecilia. Well, my father was. But how does an undocumented immigrant get drafted if they're not citizen? I, I don't know. That's a very good question. And when he was 15, he joined that uh, civilian military training corps when he was 15. Mm-hmm. And so he, wor- he, he worked through, he got in uh, as a second lieutenant, then first lieutenant, but he was not a citizen. And he got his he got his papers while he was in Omaha to to go to active duty and I have the telegram that says you are to report to active duty June I think it was June thirtieth, nineteen forty two, uh, to a station in, in Nebraska. And so he was not even a citizen. Wow, Cecilia, when when did, when do you expect your what's the name of your book and when do you expect it to be published? Well, it's supposed to be um, all the all the uh, manuscripts supposed to be in at the end of October, but the title of the book is Dr. Hector P. Garcia, a uh, physician, soldier, father, a daughter's perspective. Okay, and we are going to take a quick break on the sure. Canada show, and with me is Cecilia. Garcia Akers, the daughter of the famous Dr. Hector P. Garcia, the founder of the American GI Forum, 
and uh, we will return after these messages. Let's continue the program in a minute. You're listening to The Kaonda Show. We'll be right back. A message from George Lopez. Today's library is not what you remember. It's even better. Want to research your next vacation? Get homework help? Write a resume? Surf the web? Or maybe you just want to curl up with your favorite book and enjoy some peace and quiet. It's all here. It's all at your library. A message from the American Library Association's campaign for America's libraries. A public service announcement from your friends at CRN Live. Need to get away for a while to rejuvenate? Then consider a vacation house in the beautiful East Valley of Mesa, Arizona, near a variety of water parks, rivers, and lakes, and other types of entertainment to wash the stress away. Just go to www.redmountainstay.com to get started on your vacation arrangements. Or call 480-436-9005 to reserve your stay. Also a great idea for Arizona residents wanting a vacay stay. Corporate housing is also available. Ask your representative for more details. We're back with more of the Kaonda Show with your host, Dee Dee Blaze. Welcome back to the Kaonda Show. And with me is my guest, Cecilia Garcia Akers, the daughter of the famous Dr. Hector P. Garcia, the founder of the American GI Forum, which exploded with Grove when he sent that famous letter to politicians, including the president, during the whole Longoria affair debacle. Can you tell us about that, Cecilia? Right. Yeah, Mrs. Longoria came to my father because she said that the Three Rivers uh, funeral home denied use of the chapel for a wake for Felix Longoria, who had been killed in World War II. So he, of course, that was not acceptable to him. Like, he would never take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. So he sent out all these telegrams. He called the funeral home director that verified, yeah, no, we don't we don't let Mexicans use our facilities because they get drunk and they're rowdy and blah, 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 blah. So he sent a telegram that reached uh, Senator Lyndon B. Johnson, who wrote him back, and he said at the widow's, uh, his widow's approval, I will have Felix Longoria buried in Arlington National Cemetery, which was in February of 1949. Wow. So he was the first Mexican-American buried in Arlington National Cemetery. That's the ultimate slap in the face. That is. And even Senator Johnson said, I, I hate to see racism extend even beyond our life, which is exactly what they did, and, you know, they denied it and caused, called my father a liar. Even to this day, people from Three Rivers say he was a liar. And, I mean, I had been to arguing with them about that, and, you know, it's just uh, they, just, they just can't believe. They just don't want to give him the uh, credit that he deserves for what he did. And, and what they did was wrong to Felix Longoria, private Felix Longoria, and to his widow. I mean, that's the sad part. Here she is trying to handle her husband's remains, and they mm -hmm. are just, you know. Wow. What are some more moments that you remember? <laughs> I know. Because, I, could, I, mean, I I'm just talk. sucking this up like a sponge, you know. <laughs> I could talk all day. Well, you know, I, th I think I worked for him in his office. I think that ta taught me so much about how to treat people. He taught me the best medical care, which I use today as a physical therapist, and how to take care of people. Uh, he was so generous with his time. Uh, and, and, you know, I think everybody just loved him. I mean, there, was, there, there were moments with him every day that I am so grateful for those moments that I had with him that could never be replaced, things I could never learn from a book. Uh, he was just an incredible, incredible man, uh, highly intelligent, but he never made you feel that he was. And I think that was a good point about him. He could talk to the President of the United States. He could talk to the President of Mexico. But then he could talk to his patients on their level and make him feel good about themselves. So he was so well loved that, you know, I, I, even a book I'm writing about him cannot cover everything. Uh, about my father. And, and, you know, he has many, many accomplishments. You can go to my website and see a page there of his accomplishments. Give us uh, your website. They, it's www.drhectorpgarciafoundation.org. Okay. And where can they locate you 
on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah, my Facebook is there, Dr. Hector Page. Uh, the foundation has a page. I have a personal page. And on the website is my cell phone number that they can reach me in my email. So I am very reachable. Very good. Can you share your email address with my audience? Sure. It's Cecilia, C-E-C-I-L-I-A, A-K-E-R-S, 25, at S-A-T-X dot R-R dot com. I just love to hear from everybody. Good. And your book, when, Wendy, I want to have you back on the show to talk about your book once it's published. Sure, and when sure. When can we expect that? It's mm-hmm. going to be published next year. In fact, I, I need to start sending over photographs at the end of September, and they want the manuscript at the end of October. And they, they already were calling me about it Friday, so I think they're anxious to get it done. And, and uh, this is going to be very different. This is not a historical analysis of him, but a personal perspective of him and, and, and you know, my mother and, and his impact on our family and just the kind of person that he was and kind of father that he was and physician. And I think things about my father that nobody knows are going to be in that book. 2016 is a big year for, for the book for people like me to learn more about Dr. Hector P. Garcia, the founder of the American GI Forum, a dynamic man, a dynamic Mexican-American Chicano hero, in my view, and um, his legacy continues through his daughter. Um, I want to give you a moment to give you the opportunity, Cecilia, to, if you have a burning message in your heart, your soul, your mind, what is it that you want to share with, with the listeners that are listening to this? I think I would like everyone to go research him. You know, you can go to uh, on the Internet and find so many things about him. But understand that the way we live today, even though it's not perfect, was because of him and his efforts that we can go to professional schools. We can get degrees. We can become attorneys. We can become doctors. You know, we we have certain rights. Uh, and it was all because of him, because of the sacrifices that he made. And he would have been for health care reform. He would have been for Obamacare. Uh, you know, he he didn't want anyone to suffer. And I, and I think that, you know, keep it keep it in your head. It was because of this man that our lives are so are so good today because of his efforts. And so many people don't know that or know about him. Very good. Is there a museum uh, in the works? No, not really. You know, we're working with A and M about getting his papers digitized, and you know, I've been bat- battling them now for a couple of years, and uh, getting the archives done, and also the uh, his artifacts. And you know what? When that building gets dedicated, I am going to be donating my father's Presidential Medal of Freedom to them. Oh, Plus wow. some other things that I have: his Army Bronze Star Medal. His medical school rings. I have his wedding ring. I have some other things that you know they need to have, or if they want them, if if you know, we'll go someplace else if I can't get this building done. But this is my goal through my foundation to get my father that building on the campus of A and M because all his papers are there. You're looking at 700 linear feet and over 7,500 photographs. How do we, I mean, are you getting people who are interested in donating to your foundation? Do I just go to your website? To yeah, you can you can donate directly on the website uh, to the foundation to help us out. You know, we accept everything, any amount, you know, we don't care. I mean, we're having our big event in January in Corpus on my father's birthday. So we, we do very well on that. Uh, you know, it, it's just a long process, and I have to be patient, but... I, I tell everyone they've had those documents since 1990, so, you know, it's time to do something with them. So it's not it, – it's for the public, it's for the students, it's for Mex- all Mexican-Americans from across the country and Canada, whoever wants to come, to view his work because it is very worthwhile to understand his impact on this country. And the, the freedoms that we have today are due to him. So it, it's just a win-win situation. We just need the money. You got it. Well, thank you for appearing on the Kionda show, and I want to have you back when your book oh, is thank published. You. Thanks to all your listeners, too. This is Didi Garcia Blaze, and we just finished listening to Cecilia Garcia Akers, the daughter 
of Dr. Hector P. Garcia, my number one Mexican-American Chicano hero. With me today, again, as a recurring guest on my show is J.T. Campos, who is a professional actor. J.T., I don't think it's a secret that Hollywood and the entertainment industry lacks making movies with regard to Chicano and our Mexican-American slash Latino heroes, is it? No, Didi, it's not a secret. It's great to hear your voice, by the way, and thank you for having me again. Thank uh, you for oh, coming. Sadly to say, it's no secret. Uh, not enough of what we'd like to see or what we should be seeing and what they continue to show us and depict us as in, in the industry. What's coming down the pike with regard to Chicanos and or Mexicans, American heroes? Uh, are you hearing? What's the buzz? Well, uh, I've got a lot of things going on over here in Texas. That's the buzz. I've taken on a role as a producer and teamed up beautifully with uh, Sweet Mesquite Productions uh, with my boy Richard Stribal and Mary Lou Castillo. Mary Lou Castillo is the founder of Lupe Arte. Um, I don't know if I told you some time ago, Lupe Arte, they hired me to go and teach in some schools and for the less less privileged, less fortunate. In doing so, Latinas Unidas por el Arte, Lupe Arte, is a multimedia nonprofit arts education organization. We encourage Latino arts and culture within the Austin, Texas community here. We're inspired by the lack of arts in the education here in Texas, and we've decided not to focus on just one discipline, but to work with film, theater, visual arts, and many other areas of arts. And in doing so, we we see the need. As you said, it's no secret. There's a famous documentarian named uh, Hector Galan. I'm, I'm sure you know his work best by Los Lonely Boys, the documentary of Los Lonely Boys, Crossroads, and Cotton Fields. Give me in that just so you know. Uh, but yeah, that was my first introduction to Hector Galan. Hector Galan is just an amazing man. He's also best known for his four-part PBS series, Chicano, History of the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement. And I've just had the pleasure of the pleasure and the privilege of just working alongside this gentleman and, and I mean, you want to talk about making the Chicano movement happen. That This guy's doing his thing with the documentaries and he's helping with Daniel Peña. Daniel Peña is a documentary about uh, a gentleman who's helped keep the tradition of the Mexican national sport like Charreria going. And I don't know if you know about the Charreria. It's a cultural tradition sport. It's practiced in Mexico and, of course, here in the United States. Uh, you have male participants called the charros. They compete in roping and riding events, and the escaramuzas are teams of women. They execute daring feats and precision maneuvers while riding side saddle. Mm -hmm. So we're doing this documentary because we do see the need. The dying culture, isn't it? The stories continue with us and, you know, realize they're not telling our stories. And if they're not telling them, who's going to tell the story? Hector Galan is a Tejano from San Angelo, Texas, which is pretty much my hometown. And like you said, uh, he created the four-part PBS series, Chicano History of the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement. And so essentially you're telling us that Coming Down the Pike is another uh, work that you are helping with with regard to yes, vaqueros, correct? Vaqueros and the charros and the escaramuzas. It's pretty awesome just being involved of being involved being involved of telling the history of our culture, uh, some of our culture. Not everyone knows it. I mean, we don't. We're not only known for our great food and beautiful women and our our undying spirit, our undying spirit to just. We're better than a Boy Scout. What can I say? Sometimes. <laughs> okay. So when when do you expect that this uh, the Mexican Horseman documentary will be out? Do you know, or I know we're it's in the future. Wrapping, but... we're, well, we're wrapping it up here real soon. I mean, gosh, honestly, we'll be filming our next scene the twentieth on another charreria here in Austin, Texas. No worries on that. I don't want to really get into the specifics of where okay. and when, but sure, we we, we are filming. And that's pretty much our last piece and our last segment. And after that, we go back to the editing table. We chop it up, piece it together, and hopefully by January, February, it should be out. And uh, then we go into working with uh, the beautiful gentleman that you had on your show recently, Mr. Alan Hernandez, and doing his thing also with Hector Galan because uh, he's just moved by that gentleman's art. Going with uh, who we are as a people, so many beautiful things, Didi. Thank you for coming on the show, JT. That wraps up our time. We're going to 
be uh, going into the next segment on how to write a movie script. And I want to thank you for coming on the show and giving us uh, the professional polls in Texas and what to look for. Let's continue the program in a minute. You're listening to The Kaonda Show. We'll be right back. A message from George Lopez. Today's library is not what you remember. It's even better. Want to research your next vacation? Get homework help? Write a resume? Surf the web? Or maybe you just want to curl up with your favorite book and enjoy some peace and quiet. It's all here. It's all at your library. A message from the American Library Association's campaign for America's libraries. A public service announcement from your friends at CRN Live. We're back with more of the k Show with your host, Dee Dee Blaze. This is Dee Dee Garcia Blaze with the k Show, a brand new show that shines a spotlight on Chicanos and Latinos and anybody who's willing to work with our community. And with me today is Israel Marquez, who is an award-winning film director of independent films, uh, doing work out of Grand Prairie, Texas, as well as Austin, Texas. And uh, the reason why we're bringing him on to the show is because I have had some listeners um, have come to me and wanting to create create their own movie script. They, a bunch of people out there have a bunch of ideas. just seems like we're going into a, a new era, and we've got jazzed up Chicanos and Latinos who want to get creative, and they want to do so in creating a movie script. Welcome to the show again. Hey, thank you for having me. Like I explained, you know, I've had people come to me saying they've they've had aspirations of writing a movie script, but they don't know how to go about doing this. So, you know, that's why I'm going to you. <laughs> that's really good. I'm I'm glad you're having people come and ask you because I think writing is one of the main. It's a, it's actually the main starting point. You know, a lot of times people just write just to write. You know, if you really want to reach your audience and touch your audience, you really really have to dig down deep. If you want to write a comedy or something that's something different. You know. My my films are dramas, and I like to you know make sure I the audience walks away with something you know maybe hopefully change something in their lives. So how many movies do you have under your belt? So still? far I have uh, six short films, and three of those I've won several awards on, and two others I have not released yet, and one is done. I just hadn't put it out in the uh, film festivals yet. That was my latest one called Rose. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I'm, I got like another full feature scheduled for next year. So that's, that'll be my first full feature scheduled for next year. You know, it, it's important to do short films first. That way you can sharpen your craft, just get better at it. Short films are lessened. There's a lot of people that uh, make the mistake of going directly into a full feature, and 99.5% of the time it's going to fail. And I only say that because, you know, I, I'm telling you from experience. How many pages is typical of a movie script for a short film versus a full featured film? It all depends. You know, I usually uh, regulate my films by film festival because they all have, like, different criteria. Some will say just 10 minutes. Some will say 45 minutes. You know, it just all depends. I always tell people, write and write until you're done, regardless if it's short. I mean, regardless if there's five pages or 100 pages. Just mm -hmm. write until you're done and you tell your story and you're happy with it. And then they can sort of condense it from there? Yeah, or they can leave it the way it is. You know, Most of my films are like 30 minutes, 25 minutes, the short film. You know, and some people are always tell me, hey, you need to cut it down. I'm like, no, it's good the way it is. I'm not going to cut it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And there are there are film festivals you can submit to that only ask for like I said ten minutes. It can be the ten minutes max or forty five minutes max. You know, so you just there's, there's a wide range out there now. So just write and and write until you're done and you're happy. What are the basic mechanics writing a movie script? For for me, just speaking for myself, I think starting off with you have to tell yourself what kind of story do I want to do. All right, so it can either be a drama, horror, you know, comedy. But you, mm -hmm. you have to identify with what it is you want to do first. And from there on, you know, what I usually do is I'll, I'll listen to music because everything that I write is musically inspired. There's not one screenplay that I have not written that didn't come from a song that I heard or playing guitar or something, you know. There, everything, everything's musically inspired, you know, for me. So that's what I do. I'll go and find some music, listen to the radio, go through my uh, CD collection and just I find some song that moves me and... Once it does, you know, I, I get the inspiration to write, and I just I just start writing and come up with a really great story, and and then just you know, creating good characters, good dialogue. In a drama, you want to reach your audience. You want them to walk away with something. 
like my first film, Hey Angel, it was, it was my first short film, and there was no dialogue. It was all just mm-hmm. acting and music. It was a silent film. I had everybody in the theater at the film festival that were crying, you know. At first, I thought they were crying because it was such a bad film. <laughs> but at the end, they were like, man, that really touched me, you know. I was able to do that without any words. That's when I knew that was my thing. So then once I started doing dialogue and stuff like that, I started to understand the mechanics of music, dialogue, scene, the mood of the scene, and your actors. And you got to pick the right actors, too. How, do, how does a person create that interesting plot? I mean, can you give us some plotting skills? Yeah, basically, I go back to, you know, listening to music. One of my short films that's in circulation in the film festivals right now called No Sunshine. I had no interest in writing a crime drama or anything like that. But this song mm-hmm. came on while I was on my way to Austin, actually. It was uh, Ain't No Sunshine by Bill Withers. Mm-hmm. And as it was playing right away, I, I kind of got, I saw the ending, you know. So, so these two guys robbing a convenience store. Uh, they ended up, one had to end up killing the other because he was going to kill an innocent person. And the other one wasn't like that. So right away, just from that song, I got that scene. So I started writing that scene and I started writing backwards. I wrote from the end to the, back to the beginning. Pretty much all my plots, all my ideas, all my inspirations come out of music. And they can hit me at any time. And, and people will be inspired to write different ways. You know, that's just my way. Now, when you start writing out your script, do you have like a like a board where you just sort of start out with this outline? Or do you start out with an outline and then you start writing from the outline? Or how does that work? Everything is just from the imagination. As soon as I see the scene in my head and the music starts playing, I'll continue to write it. And I'll have that song playing constantly until I'm done writing the, the whole screenplay. What's the longest, in pages, the longest screenplay you've written? The longest screenplay I have to date is over 500 pages. And it's because it's a story of my life as I was growing up. I was a boxer, a professional fighter, and just all the stuff that I saw in my life. And, you know, so it, it's endless. I could write more to it. And I'm going to have to take that 500 pages and narrow it down to maybe like 100 or 90, you know. So, but yeah, that's my longest screenplay. I know that you're working on a film regarding the lead singer of Chingon, Robert Rodriguez's band. Are you done with that movie script? Is that a work in progress? The, the screenplay is... I would say about 70% done. But what we had talked about, me and I talked about Alex Ruiz, me and him talked about it, and I think we're going to go ahead and try to do a TV series with this story. I've been interviewing a lot of people that have interesting stories, and they've lived this long road, and, and they want to write about their life. And so you're suggesting that they just, you know, break out the, the typewriter or the computer or a a pad and start writing and that's how you start and just write 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 and so how would these people drop a movie script into a film director's hand Israel I mean do they go to people like you how does it work you know you you write your screenplay it's good uh if you don't want to shoot it yourself or you don't have the means you know I write my own stuff I direct my own stuff I shoot my own stuff I edit my own stuff you know but if you don't want to do that and you have a really cool screenplay that you feel that's, that can you know, do something with it, it's good to go to, like, uh, mixers and, you know, industry mixers and stuff like that and get to know people. Because you just don't want to drop your, your baby off at some daycare that, you know, doesn't really care, right? <laughs> <laughs> screenplays to me are like baby, you know. I take care of them and I, I nourish them and make sure they're make sure they grow, you know. Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's always important just to go find mixers and events and get to know some directors and other writers and, and music composers and stuff, and do it that way. There's a lot of there's a lot of up and coming directors in the independent industry because you know technology is evolving so much that it's allowing people to be creative. So there's a lot of up and coming directors that are looking for content, you know, to shoot. So that would be my best advice is to go out there into industry mixers, you know, and get to know some directors and always, and this is, this is the main thing. And this goes on for actors too. Um, Mm -hmm. If you're going to drop your screenplay into a director's hand, ask to see some of their work. You know what I mean? Oh, first. Yeah. First, Hey, what what have you done? Can I see some of your work? I'd always tell it to the actors too. I'm like, Hey, don't just go and take a job, you know, because the director may not know what he's doing or whatever. I've been trying, but, it's just, it may not be what you want to uh, get involved with. So I always ask to see people's work. 
But yeah, the, going to the mixers and, and events like that and getting to know some directors, that's the best way to do it. So then they would want to know who the film up and coming film directors are who have a good uh, working experience, and they would obviously want to strike a relationship with them and talk about their movie script, about their lives that they've written, and hopefully yeah. the film director will take it, right? Yeah, just pitch it to them, you know. And usually, in the independent film industry, they usually do it, you know, because they're they're wanting to, you know advance too. And mm-hmm. a lot of directors don't really write, you know what I mean? I know a bunch of directors that do not write at all. They're always asking me for stuff. You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that that's that's a very uh that's very important to know because there's a lot of directors out there that don't write and they're looking for content. And they wow. attend all these mixers and stuff like that, industry mixers and it's very easy now. It's very easy. But always ask to see their work. So okay. film directors usually go to these mixtures to look for film writers of movie scripts then. Is that correct? Yeah. They go look for uh, screenwriters, DPs, you know, musicians, composers, you know, actors. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 I've been to many where um, one director can cast a whole his whole film at one mixer. He's like, oh, hey, you want to work on this? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Are you serious? Whole, yeah, it happens all the time. I quit going to mixers because I already have my my team that I have and a certain set of actors that I work with. So, But every now and then I do when I'm looking for a certain person, you know, I want to bring on a new face. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, for instance, today I cast uh, a new face for a little another grindhouse short from that we're doing in next month, actually. Mm-hmm. She's new, and, you know, I met her. It was a, a commercial shoot. And just, but just stuff like that, you know, you just meet people here and there, you know, and that's just, you just network, just network. Well, thank you. I, in a nutshell, uh, what you're telling me and the audience is, you know, sit down and write your own story about your life, and hopefully it's interesting enough, and get out yeah. there to these mixers and meet film directors who have good experience, up and coming film directors who are looking for content that is out there be, because many of them don't write um, and hopefully they can connect that way and that'll get and the ball like, rolling, right? And it, yeah, and if you really, really want to get down to it, I mean, I take a page out of Robert Rodriguez's book, you know, because he's the guy that got me started, you know, with his book, uh, Rebel Without a Crew and all his 10-minute film schools. Mm-hmm. But I would, I would say the same thing. Write your own stuff. Shoot your own stuff, direct your own stuff, edit your own stuff, learn all of these things. That way you're not dependent on other people. He he said that in his tutorials and stuff like that in his book, and I followed that. It was a long journey because I was not – I didn't know what I was doing, but now I went from working a handheld camera to I can work anything from a red to an area Alexa, you know, just because of his words and what he said, so – I would, I would just pass that on to everybody else. Hey, if you're going to write something, go ahead and direct it, shoot it, edit it, and, and get to know it, all aspects of the, the filmmaking process. That way you're not depending on people. That's what I would tell everybody. And start with a short film. Start with short film. Don't jump into a feature. Okay. If you, do not jump into a feature. That's I'm telling you from experience and me seeing other people doing making that mistake too. I know it's really cool and everybody wants to be a director and stuff, but you have to learn. You know, when I first started boxing when I was a kid, I didn't just say, hey, I want to fight Oscar De La Hoya. You know, <laughs> I had to go learn from the very beginning, you know. <laughs> Eventually I did, you know, in the sparring session, but, I, you know, you just don't do that. <laughs> and that okay. applies for everything else, you know. Very good. Well, thank you for appearing on the show, and I can't wait to have you on the show again when you're ready to – release information with regard to Alex Ruiz, who is the oh, yeah. singer of Chingon, and thank you so much, Israel. Of course, always. Don't forget to pencil the Kayonda Show in your calendar. The program airs Thursday nights at 7 p.m., and then again on Sundays at 5 p.m. here on CRN Live. A segment will be on location, so you might experience some acoustic anomalies which were not fixable in production. We apologize in advance. Now, let's continue with this educational program with Dee Dee Blaze on the Kayonda Show. 
is Didi Garcia Blaze with the brand new Que Onda show, a radio show program that shines a light on Mexican Americans, Chicanos, Latinos, and anybody who's willing to work with our community. And uh, today with me is a very special guest by the name of AJ Castillo, who is a conjunto Tejano player out of Texas, and uh, it's my understanding he's taking Texas by storm. Welcome to the show, AJ. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Tell us about yourself. When did you start? Uh, what's your passion in music? Yeah, no, I started at about the age of 10. I started performing, started, uh, I picked up the accordion as one of the, the instruments that I was drawn to, the accordion, and and uh, my grandfather used to play the accordion, so I kind of just kind of grew up listening to the accordion, and, and in the Tejano, the Tejano scene, the accordion is the main instrument. At the time when I was growing up, before, you know, the Tejano in the 60s, there used to be orchestra, there used to be horns, and, and uh, just different uh, synthesizers, and then towards the 90s when I, when I was growing up, it was the accordion, so that's that's what I was drawn to, the accordion, and, and I picked it up, and ever since then, you know, I've been blessed. At about the age of 15 is when, when I really had this this epiphany, you know, to where I had this formula in my head about playing the accordion, and, and I just started performing with my dad and my uncle. They had a local band here in Austin, Texas, is my hometown. And after that, I went to college in San Antonio. I went to San Antonio to... For my for my bachelor's degree in business management, and that's where I met so many different people, musicians, and I started working with um, Grammy winning producers, and I started performing. I was playing with all these bands, and that's when I realized, you know, I need to make my own record. I need to do something for the Onda. The Onda has, you know, they have these older musicians, but I felt like in order for us to continue, we need to have an artist, a younger artist that speaks to younger kids, some somebody that they can look up to, somebody that they feel is relevant, you know what I'm saying, because it's hard for a younger kid to see somebody that's 50 years old or 60 years old, no offense, but, you know, for a 10-year-old to connect with somebody that's 50 is going to be a little bit, it's kind of it's kind of spread out, it's, it's a little bit too far, so I felt like in order to keep our, our genre, the Tejano scene, the Tejano music going, it's going to continue to come out with a fresh new sound, and that's what I'm trying to do right now. AJ, I know what you mean because um, a lot of our listeners include the up-and-coming-of-age folks, the younger generation and the next generation. We have a lot of the OGs, the older generation. And so I believe that what you're doing is you're continuing on with the, the hot music and keeping it alive because I've been told that People think that the Hano music has died, and, and I just refuse to accept that. What are your views on that? Well, I don't think it's dead. Clearly, it's not dead, but I just think it's it's a little bit stagnant right now. And, and one of the things that I believe is, is as an artist, we need to give back to our fans, give back to our Chicano people, give our Tejano people, our Mexicano people uh, a better product. We need to give them better music, better songs, a better show. And we need to give them our all. And what I mean by our all is if you were to come to an AJ Castillo show, we make time for our fans. We Anyone who comes to see me, guaranteed you're, you're going to be able to talk to me. You can We can take a picture. I'd love to meet you. I mean, you know, granted, there are shows we do. There's 10,000 people. Of, of course, I can't meet every person in the 10,000 attendance. But, you know, for the most part, we, we establish a, a great fan base and we talk to our fans. We you know, if you talk to us on social media, you send me a message, I'll get back to you. It might not be right now, but chances are I'm going to get back to you. And, I mean, just giving our all, 110% at every show, and from from the lighting to the sound to, to everything, you know, it's all for the fans. And, and I grew up doing it because I love it. You know, I think a lot of new artists in any genre, they they see musicians, they see rappers, they see singers, they sing just musicians in general, and they think, man, they're making a lot of money, and I want to do it because I want to make money. And in my opinion, that's the wrong reason to do things. You know, the reason why I got into the music is because I love it, and I was passionate about it. My dad played it. My uncle played the Hano music. My my grandfather's played the Hano music. So it's been in my blood, and I love it. Regardless if I'm making money or not, this is what I love to do. This is my culture. Who are your accordion influences? One of the biggest influences that I have is it would have to be Steve Jordan, Esteban Jordan. Um, in my opinion, the Michael Jordan of the accordion. He's an incredible, an incredible player. Uh, rest in peace, Esteban Jordan. You know, I, I spent many nights um, falling asleep with my accordion, choking myself, uh, 
to learning learning his songs, every single one of his songs, every single one of his licks, and you know just because I was attracted to his music and his style because it was the hardest. It was so complex. It was just out of this world, and and I wanted to to play the hard songs. I didn't want to play the easy songs. I wanted to learn the hardest stuff. So that was my biggest influence on the accordion. Very good. How can our listeners get a hold of you? Sure. You can hit me up on Facebook. You can look me up, AJ Castillo. You can um, follow me on Instagram. If you have an Instagram, you have to hit me up, AJ Castillo, but instead of an O at the end, it's a zero. So AJ Castillo, LL, zero. Hit me up on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, Send me a message. I'd love to meet you. You can also go to AJCastillo.com. I believe we're going to be in the Phoenix area in December. So we're going to be back in Phoenix in December. It's going to be a very special show. I believe it's December the 13th on a Sunday. It's going to be free for all the listeners. If you're listening, it's going to be a free show in December in Phoenix. I'm really excited about that. I love being in Arizona. Uh, We just shot a DVD in Tucson at the Casino del Sol, and the DVD should be out hopefully uh, October, maybe November. October possibly for my birthday. I want to I wanna have it out by October for my birthday, but if not, it'll be out in November. Tell everybody about it. It's going to be an incredible DVD. We captured it at the, the Ava Amphitheater in uh, Casino del Sol, and the crowd was just turned up. The crowd was uh, energetic, and it's just it was an incredible show, so I'm excited about that. Well, I look forward to seeing you play when you come to Phoenix, and we will definitely promote that, and um, I look forward to your new CD, and I will definitely buy that and let everybody know about that. And uh, now we're going to be playing uh, Dame Tu Amor. Thank you for appearing on the show, AJ. Thank you so much for having me. Andale. Que me tienen embrujado Ay, yo quiero que me miren un poquito Esa boquita que me tiene enloquecido Ay, yo quiero que me besen un ratito Porque este amor solo se duerme en tus brazos Si tú le cantas se arrulla rapidito Porque este corazón palpita con tu amor Dame tu amor, dame tu amor Ay, yo quiero que me quieras un poquito Dame tu amor, dame tu amor
to The Kaonda Show with your host, Dee Dee Blaze. This program is the property of Star Sound Music Group, Hollywood, California, and is available for syndication by emailing your request to affiliates at kaondashow.com or call 213-283-STAR. Educational institutions, please call to see if your school qualifies for free licensing on your campus radio station. This program was produced by Dee Dee Garcia Blaze. Executive producer is Frank Miranda. Imaging by David Tyler. Thank you for listening to The Kaonda Show. Don't forget to pencil The Kaonda Show in your calendar. The program airs Thursday nights at 7 p.m. and then again on Sundays at 5 p.m. here on CRN Live.